This is the C100. Canon introduced their cinema line of cameras back in 2011 with the C300. They followed up a year later with the C500 and this camera, their budget priced camera, the C100. Now this is an 8-bit camera with a Super 35 sensor, about 8 megapixels in size, and it records in AVCHD. It has the advantage of very small file sizes, even though it has the disadvantage of being 8-bit. Canon claim that with their wide DR profile, you can get 12 stops of dynamic range. And if you use Canon Log, C-Log, you can get 13 stops. Well, let's take a look at this camera and see what it can do. Now, as far as possible, I've shot everything in this video with the C100. Shots of the camera itself were taken with a Sony A7 III. And the lens on the C100 is Canon's ultra-cheap, ultra-useful 50mm f1.8. Here on the front of the camera you can see the record stop-start button. There's two of them, one on top of the handle and one down at the bottom of the camera on the left. You can also see just behind the stop-start button on the handle there is a wheel which can adjust the lens iris setting. Under the camera at the bottom you can also see the one-shot autofocus. Now, as we come around to the side, we can see there's an array of 11 buttons here. We'll go into the function of these buttons a little later on. But at the top there is a switch for power. You can turn the camera on or you can turn it to media management setting. Just above the switch and to the left there is a hook for your tape measure. That hook is set at the focal plane and that's for your focus puller to attach a tape measure and measure the distance to the subject. You won't find that on any DSLR. Now let's come around to the back of the camera. And here we can see, believe it or not, another 11 buttons. The battery is there, of course, at the bottom. This is an intelligent battery. It has a button on it which you can press and then LEDs will show the state of charge. In this case, only two LEDs, so it's half discharged. Also on the left, there is the display or control unit. Now to the right, we can see the uh, outlets and inputs for the camera. There is a DC input, HDMI out, USB and remote and uh, headphone socket. Going on to the right, on the back of the handle, there is a button for magnification, button number 7. This button can be configured to be something else. And to the right of that, there is a joystick. At the top of the camera, you can just see the EVF. Now, this EVF on this particular version of the camera is widely regarded as being completely useless. If you look in it, you can just see a... It's like looking into a room and seeing a, a screen on the other side of the room. There's a lot of empty space in there, and in the distance, you can see the screen. That's an image of the uh, display panel. So for the most part, it's not a lot of use. It has been improved a great deal in the Mark II version of this camera, which I haven't got, so I can't show it to you. On the side of the top handle, we can see two XLR inputs, full size, standard. We can see the cable connecting the electronics in the handle to the body of the camera. And we can also see a cover for a 3.5mm socket for an external microphone. Looking at the other side of the handle, you can see the audio control center. Settings there for two channels. Also, inside the handle at the front is a stereo microphone. Alright, let's take a look at what these buttons do. 
We'll start with button number eight, the magnification button. As you can see, that just increases the magnification of the image on the viewfinder so that we can focus or check focus. Peaking, button number nine. If we look closely, we can see that with this on, we've now got red lines appearing on the image. These red lines are around areas that are in focus. And the important one for us here is the eyes. And we can see there are red lines around the eyes, so they're in focus. There are two levels of peaking we can set. At the moment we've got peaking 2. We can configure these levels in the menu. Next one down is Zebras, button 10. You click that on, we don't see anything, but if we crank up the exposure by increasing the aperture, we get to a point where we've got overexposure. Now we see these stripes appearing on the image. This is the zebras. This shows us areas that are overexposed. If we take the exposure down, take the aperture down till they disappear, then every part of that image should now be properly exposed, or at least not overexposed. It should all be manageable. Ideally, of course, we want correct exposure, which we'll talk about just in a moment. Let's bring this back to where it was, back to 6.3. Now, the next button down is the waveform monitor, WFM button 11. And it brings up this little graph. This graph shows the brightness of the image across it, the frame. And you can see there is a broad stripe across the middle. That's the background. And in the middle, you can see a spike upwards in brightness. And that is the face of our model here. Now to get correct exposure, a gray card, 18% gray card, should be on something around about 40% on that scale. You can see the scale goes 0, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100. This is percentage. This scale is based on the scale originally developed by the Institute of Radio Engineers, so it's often called the IRE scale, and the values on it are often called IRE. That goes back to the earliest days of video. Next thing we'll have a look at is custom picture. That's button number, no button, no number. It's just custom picture. That uh, button is therefore not actually configurable to be something else. Pressing that button is the, is the only way we can get into this in the menu. We can ha see on the screen now that, the, that it's set to C8 wide DR. If we use the joystick, we can go in further and we can have a look at the other settings that are available here. C7 is EOS standard, and we can see this is quite uh, bright, contrasty, well saturated. It uh, doesn't get you quite the same dynamic range as YDR does, so in a setting like this where the lighting is controlled, the dynamic range is not that much of an issue. Going in the other direction, C9 is cinema. That's Canon Log. And we have a range of other settings, other profiles to choose from. Each of these can be configured to be whatever we want them to be as far as gamma and black point and other things are concerned. All right, we'll just leave that on YDR, and we'll pop out of this menu. 
by pressing the custom picture button again. And we're back here. All right, let's take a look at the push auto iris function. Let's start off by pushing the exposure off to an obviously wrong level. We push and hold the auto iris button and it brings us down to f5.6 which is close to where we had it before. So that's a useful uh, quick auto exposure when we need it. But you do need to hold that auto iris button in for a couple of seconds otherwise it won't complete its calculations. Next one along here is the ISO gain button, button 13. We press that, we see that the uh, ISO gain gets highlighted on the screen. And if we, it goes away again if we're not too quick. If we then use the joystick, we can adjust the gain or ISO, make it higher or lower by moving the joystick up and down. Let's come back to 850. 850, by the way, is the native ISO for this camera. If we move the joystick to the left or right, it will move to a different setting. Just clicking the joystick in again, that highlights the last thing we were on. Move it to the right, and we can see it moves to the uh, shutter speed. Move it to the left, and it moves to the white balance. Just click it in, and we're back to where we were. Now the next button on the side of the camera is the shutter button, button 14. If we click that one in, we see that the shutter speed is now highlighted. And it's set to 180 degrees. 180 degrees indicates that the uh, shutter speed is set to double the frame rate. Frame rate at the moment is set to 25 frames per second. And the shutter speed is double that, which is 1 50th of a second. This is the time-honored setting for cinema. We can, of course, change that uh, shutter speed to whatever we like. It does affect the uh, appearance of the video, but uh, it's a matter of personal taste more than anything. Next thing we can see here on the side of the camera is the ND filter. This is the neutral density filters which are built into the camera. And we have two set, three settings here. We have that's the first one, two stops, and then four stops, and now the camera is unable to focus, and six stops. We can come back to two stops. We can go back, sorry, to off. Let's crank it up to two stops because we'll use this to take a look at the uh, noise on the camera. Now that drops the exposure down by two F stops. Let's go to the ISO setting, bring that up to 1600, 3200. So that sets the exposure back to where it was before, but at 3200 ISO. Now let's go up another two stops of ND filter and we'll have to lift the ISO now to 6400 and 128. So that's 12,800 ISO. Picture still looks half decent on the screen here. Let's go to six stops just for the heck of it. I'm not sure if we get enough ISO to bring us up another two stops, but let's see what happens. So it would be, no, it doesn't go any higher. 128, 12,800, sorry, is the maximum. So let's come back down to no NDs and we'll push the ISO back down to 850, the native ISO. Now, the next thing I want to have a look at is the media setting on the on-off button 
or button, it's a switch actually, so it turn the camera off and then bring it around to the media setting. And what we see now is every clip on the card. We can select our clip using the joystick. Let's pick that one, click in. Now we can see what we can do here is we can convert a HD clip to an SD. We can delete, copy, or cancel. We'll cancel at the moment. We can use these buttons on the back of the camera to play, fast forward, pause, or stop, playback. All the usual buttons for video control. Now press the menu button and we'll have a quick run through the menu system. I won't dwell on any of these, I'll just go through them quickly. Now looking through the menu, back to the start, and the first uh, item in the menu or section is the camera setup. All the usual camera settings are here and uh, the shutter can be changed from angle to fractions of a second. A lot of these can be set with the uh, buttons on the side of the camera. ABB is automatic black balance. And next item down is the audio section. A few things we can do here with audio. Next one down is video setup. Nothing much to do here. Uh, then we have the LCD viewfinder setup. Here we've got such things as uh, view assist for when we're shooting log peaking. We can configure two different uh, types of, uh, or two different sets of peaking here. Under uh, peaking one and peaking two. Then we go on to zebras. And there are two distinct kinds of zebras we can set. We can set zebras with a range. And the more usual one is with a limit. HD output for zebras. And back to the uh, next one down. And we see we've got time code on this camera. And other functions, there's a lot of settings here which you probably won't want to visit very often. They're mostly set and forget. The only one you want to keep coming back on would be the uh, initialized media. Set your recording options, bit rate, frame rate. These are one offs generally. HDMI, you can uh, send your time code out through the HDMI port. Photos I wouldn't get excited about. Custom functions, you can configure buttons to do various things. Upgrade your firmware. And that's basically all the menu items. The star at the bottom is for your favorite items, which you can configure. One other thing, which uh, I neglected to mention before, is uh, the ISO. Under the ISO setting here, you can configure the ISO to have an extended range, which gives you up to 80,000 ISO instead of the uh, more usual 12,800. And that is it. That was a quick run through the menu system.
There are some other buttons on the back. This one, the clean display button. If we click it, we get a clean display. Slot select. This is incredibly useful. You can switch between slots simply by pressing a button on the back of the camera. And here, review. This is the review last clip button. If we press this, we get the last clip recorded playing back. Now a few words about autofocus. The original C100 had autofocus of a sort, but it was pretty bad. It uh, was sold as uh, one-shot autofocus, and it would hunt back and forth quite a bit before settling on something. The Mark II had dual pixel autofocus, and that was quite usable. Canon made available an upgrade to dual pixel for the original C100, and I have it on this camera. Now, it's good enough for one shot. It's good enough for a situation like, uh, like this, where I am at a more or less constant uh, distance from the camera, and there's nothing going to get in the way. Uh, but it, I mean, if there was something in front of me, like uh, out there, and the focus is going to go off, it's not really possible to, uh, to track something. It's nothing like modern autofocus, in other words. But it's, it's usable if you recognize its limitations. Put it that way. Now here's a clip where the subject is in the middle of the frame and in focus. Then she moves just slightly off-center and the focus drifts to that tree in the background. That's uh, going to ruin your shot. So in that situation, I would recommend that you use a manual follow focus. Perhaps use the autofocus to uh, get the initial focus, and then switch to manual and let it stay there. Finally, I've got some clips showing higher ISO performance. This first one is at the native ISO of 850. It's at f8, and the other clips are also at f8. This one is at 6400. And this one is at 12800. I'll leave it to you to judge what you think of the noise in these shots. Well, back to that question. Can this 11-year-old camera still hold its own today? Well, let's look at the positives. Full-size XLR inputs, ND filters built in, settings easily accessible on the outside of the camera via buttons, no need to delve into complicated internal menus. Long-life battery, you can get nearly three hours on a fresh battery. Small file sizes, three hours on a 32 gig SD card. And those are cheap, cheap SD cards. Nothing complicated, nothing high speed. Now 1080 HD might be seen to be a disadvantage, but it's perfectly adequate for delivery today. It's still probably even a standard, although everybody tends to shoot in 4K. HD delivery is probably still a de facto standard. Now, on the debit side, we have no 4K. We have very poor autofocus. There's no slow motion. And the display does not face the front. So, we have to weigh up these disadvantages with the advantages. And uh, I think, taking all in all, if we just acknowledge the shortcomings of the camera, stay away from autofocus, and just stick with manual focus, this camera is still a very useful and effective camera today. An effective team even. Hey Tom? Well, I hope that little overview has been of some use to someone. So this is Paul Campbell, signing off. Until next time. 
Sayonara.